Hey guys, this is Matt from LastChanceTackle.com, Last Chance Bait and Tackle, and Last Chance Performance Marine. Tonight's Periscope, I'm going to split it 50-50. I'm going to go over a couple new products, some that I have not used yet that we just got in, and others that I am currently using. thought you might guys, you know, you guys might want to take a look at it. Then I'll actually go into my weekend review on Diamond Valley, a local fishery. A lot of guys are kind of struggling to piece the pattern together to get these fish to go, so I figured I'd offer and drop some clues that I found over this past week with the current conditions. Okay, we're gonna get right into the actual new baits that we got in here. We actually brought in a company called Sniper Baits right here. Um, what they do, or what the guy does, is actually pour a variety of little baits from tiny flukes, from like an inch and, you know, 1.75 inches long all the way up to two and a half inches or two and a quarter inches. He offers nymph baits just like this right here, as well as mini jigs right here. Now, the sniper baits, we actually have a variety of colors coming in and are soon to be online. Um, for those of you that like to fish our bass, it's not only, like I said, say a trout lure. You saw these small little baits thinking, okay, it's just going to be trout fishing, um, local lakes, maybe Sierras, that kind of stuff like that. But for the bass guys that actually want to imitate small, fin bait forage, every year when the fry start coming about, we're actually about that time right now where you're going to start to see little fingerling bass little tiny baby bass and the bass, the, the bulk of the population is going to switch gears and feed on small bait fish just like this. Previous to this company and the other baits on the market, all we had to work with is like the three inch Sanko. We had the tiny fluke, we had small finesse fish, even small sluggos. So it's actually going to be kind of sweet that we can actually get baits in this smaller size. I wish I had one, I can let me actually open a package up and I'll actually show you what I'm dealing with. You can actually rig these doubles, as Anthony did on the previous Periscope call, talking about the donkey rig. Um, you can actually rig these things on doubles, on small darter heads, micro-type baits, stuff like this right here. And even though that is a dark color bait, very similar to that of a fluke, you can actually get them in more watermelon, red flake kind of colors like this, even small fin bait as far as like shad, silver sides, that kind of stuff. So it'll be an interesting bait. I actually can't wait to, to you know, basically tie it on there. One thing... I've been doing lately, which I'm going to talk about over here, is I told myself this year, you know, since Dime Valley opened, I'm not going to throw a swim bait. <laughs> a lot of people are making fun of me right now uh, because I've been such a huge player in our local swim bait scene, talking to people, giving tips, helping out, always on the water, doing nothing but fishing oversized baits for big fish. I told myself I'm done for right now, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick them up again. I can't be that crazy. But uh, I wanted to actually fish standard techniques. I want to fish regular baits and show people that, hey, you can catch some really, really large fish without dedicating all your hours to throwing a swim bait. Those baits are very, very good in the draw effect on these larger fish, but that same fish that's going to attack that 10-inch swim bait is going to eat a 2-inch bait. So I wanted to show people, hey, this is something that you, that you can do. So with the sniper baits right here, they definitely have a time and place. There's going to be a time when those larger bass will start feeding on that smaller fingerling type stuff. So definitely something to look at uh, if you want to take a look at these things that are going to be soon on LastChanceTackle.com as well as the broadcast on Facebook at LastChanceBaitTackle or LastChanceTackle.com. Another bait I wanted to actually show you is a lot of you guys have heard about the new company, MajorCraft. They have their rods. They have their baits. Well, Don Ivino, long-time fisherman in our, in our region right here, actually endorses MajorCraft and came out with a bait that kind of replicates the wiggle wart. It's been so hard to find old school wiggle warts. Guys have been buying them on the internet for $40 to $100, all sorts of crazy, crazy stuff. Some people say the new ones don't swim good as the old ones and all this kind of good stuff. So Don Ivino with Major Craft came out with an actual bait right here. This is a zoner. It's the ZH55. Very, very cool little bait. We went in, we went ahead and brought him in. One of our reps showed us as a, hey dude, um, Major Craft's got a new bait right here. And uh, I was kind of, you know, definitely on board with these guys right here. Obviously, you have your Delta Craw type color. You got your green craw, and you got more of like your summer craw. These baits should absolutely rip them on the river. Havasu, uh, fishing Blythe, fishing down to Martinez, fishing main current, fishing riprap, all that kind of good stuff. These baits are definitely something that I would look into. Have not thrown them yet, but everybody that I have talked to that has thrown them said they're the real deal. Um, these baits right here are going to go roughly five to six feet deep, but it all depends on line size. On a bait like this, you don't have to throw your deep diving crankbait rod. You can throw like a standard seven foot medium, seven foot medium heavy. It's not that heavy. It comes in, I think, at like seven sixteenths of an ounce. Not very heavy at all. You don't need anything crazy, but definitely one to look at. Again, I only pulled a few colors, 
And definitely take a look at LastChanceTackle.com. We have a variety of the, the Major Craft prank baits, but these ones right here, I figured would actually... Yeah, actually, let me relocate. That way you can see the progression. But uh, these particular baits right here, I do think have a place in your tackle box. One thing to look at. Very, very cool. So now on to baits that I have been using on Diamond Valley. Um, like I said in this little bit ago, I put away the swim bait rod. I'm not throwing huds. I'm not throwing my mother right now. I'm not throwing my slide swimmers, all that kind of stuff. I literally said no go. I need to go out there. I need to fish standard techniques. I need to catch some fish and see if I can put together these big bags with standard techniques. So I've been doing a number of things, and I'm actually going to get this is going to lead into our Diamond Valley review, talking about the different things that I've covered. But I don't know if you guys know, but uh, obviously, aside from like the Easy Shiners, the Swing Impact, Swing, swing Impact Fats, Kitech has come out with a bunch of different little baits that haven't really taken off yet. People don't really talk about it, maybe because they're good, maybe they're not. You never know. But one bait I was very intrigued by, and it's it's hard to find a bait that will actually duplicate, let's say, a Robo Worm for that of the drop shot and all that kind of good stuff. So Kitech came out with the Easy Shaker. What it is... It's a smaller, smaller plastic worm right here, talking four and a half inches long. Very, very supple, very soft, and they actually brought in a lot of their key colors that have been popular in the Swimbait series. Silver Flash Minnow, Green Pumpkin, Electric Shad. We literally have probably 13 different colors of Easy Shakers in stock, and I just picked out some of the ones that I've been using, and it's hard to go against a Robo Worm. Let's face it, Robo Worm, Bass Chow, the Flick Shake, you know, Jackal Cross Tail Shad. There's so many very good drop shot baits out on the market today. It's hard for a company like Kitech to say, hey, I want in. I want to do something. So um, doing what I do best at <laughs> the last chance of bait and tackle is when a new product comes in, I snatch a couple of them. I go up to Diamond Valley or go to whatever lake I'm fishing at that time, whether it be Skinner or whatever. And I go test them. I, I can waste a day on that lake because I go there so often to experiment with different baits because it's if I don't catch fish it's not like I can't go back tomorrow <laughs> so with these baits right here I took uh, actually this one right here uh, the electric bluegill out there very good bait my first drop on a, on a meter mark on the graph picked up a bass on the drop shot obviously with this particular one fish were relating towards the bottom half of the water column I was fishing uh, main lake points isolated rock out there saw them on the graph I was like whatever pin this thing on dropped it straight down Hooked up immediately. I was like, that was cool. So a couple casts later, around this little particular spot I was fishing, I bombed another cast out there, cracked him. It uh, it turned out to be a regular bait that's on the deck. And prior to you know this year, I I don't drop shot. I'm not that finessed. Smallest thing I throw for finesse is like a five inch thin sanko or a Texas rig four to six inch worm. So when I actually picked these things up there, it was kind of a not a confidence booster, but it, basically told me, okay, I can still do this stuff. I can still throw the little baits. And a lot of people probably laughing at me right now because my main focus right now is I have to learn how to catch 25 bites a day. Now, it sounds kind of stupid when I say it that way, but for as long as I can remember, since Diamond Valley pretty much opened up, my whole mentality has always been fish for five bites, five big bites. I don't need to catch 20 fish, 30 fish, 40 fish in a day. If it happens, cool. If not, I fish for five bites, so at like 10, 12 o'clock in the morning, afternoon, if I don't have a fish in the boat, I'm cool, I'm content. Unlike a lot of people that are fishing tournaments, they need to get over the hump early. So this is actually a cool little bait right here, and I've been throwing a lot of drop shot lately. Now, I'm going to say that I'm saving the best for last because this is a bait that a lot of people have seen on the internet, but not a lot of people have gone out there to actually buy. I mean, unless you've been following Mega Bass, all that kind of stuff. This right here is called the Dog X, the Diamante. I'm actually going to pull one out for, to show you guys. Now, there's a lot of spook style baits on the market. A lot of people copying the Rover, um, copying the Vixen, the Sammy, all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of them out there, so it's very hard for anglers to actually say, okay, why is this one better than anything else? It's a tough question. A lot of it has to do with personal, you know, personal style, what they look for in a bait. Um, this particular bait I took out, uh, it weighs three quarter ounce, roughly five and a half inches long. I took it out the other day, and I'm going to talk about this on the Periscope and what I've been doing. Um, and I actually had a very, very good day. This one right here is called HT Tennessee Shad. What it is, it's more of a uh, kind of like a, a, a translucent body to it. A little bit of chartreuse on the tail end of the bait. I'm a big fan of chartreuse on the tail of my baits. I don't really like chartreuse baits, but I like that effect right there. It gives a fish something to track on. 
more of a pearl purple belly right here. These things shoot immediately or shoot very, very well on the cast. And I don't have to have anything fancy to throw this rod. I actually throw this on a F575 double X, a Rochi double X rod. It's called the Extreme Mission Type F. I'm like a broken record when I talk about that rod. But it's a seven foot five action rod. Um, a soft tip, a lot of backbone. I can launch a walk bait a long distance. And the thing about that rod that kind of blended in with this bait in particular is the rod isn't that soft in the tip. It has a soft tip, but it's fairly fairly stout in a way. It's, it's kind of a bad description of the rod. It's not a noodle stick like that of a jerk bait rod, but it's not as heavy as a worm and a jig rod. It's just a good medium heavy action rod. That rod paired up with a high gear ratio reel, 30 pound braid, uh, with this particular bait right here is money. Um, what I do with this bait in specific is I'll actually take a section of 15 to 20 pound monofilament line. Okay, I'm going to cut myself off a section maybe 15 to 8 inch, 18 inches long. And what I do is on my braid, I'll splice to that monofilament. And then on the opposite end, I obviously tie my bait. I want to keep that leader no more than 15 inches long. That way, when I wind up make another cast, I don't have that knot in the tip top, and it doesn't hang up, it doesn't backlash, it doesn't do anything, I don't shoot my bait off. What that does is as I'm walking these baits, any bait that has a forward momentum glide, surface bait, or even subsurface bait, when you walk that bait, and you walk it back and forth, pop, 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 say you stop it and kick that bait out, that bait's not stopping. It's going to glide over top of your line, therefore fouling up off it. So by having that mono section in front of the bait, you don't want to use floor because fluorocarbon sinks. With mono in front of that bait, it, it stiffens that up, so it prevents it from catching, having your hooks catch your braid, catching your leader, whatever. So a very, very cool little thing. Definitely look at these guys right here. It says STW on the package, meaning support to win. But uh, it's the Dog X, the Diamante. And I'm probably saying it wrong, but that's how I always say it, so that's cool. But uh, I have two different colors right now I wanted to show you guys. Obviously, the HT Tennessee Shad, and this is right here called the Biwako Clear Gill. Um, this one right here is a very, very cool bait for those sunny, sunny days. I'll show you. This right here, I like this in the overcast condition. It's not so much solid, but it actually stands out. That shark juice on the back end right there really, really pops the pearl size, and it actually flashes its back. I don't know if you can see that. It's almost like a chameleon paint job on the back. Very, very good for that uh, clear, off-color water, cloudy conditions. When you're dealing with the sun, here's the Biwako clear gill right here. Very awesome little bluegill limitation right here. It's a fairly transparent bait. Let's see if I can actually have Megan hold it up to the light. If you look through that bait, it might yeah. blur it. I don't, you can kind of see it? Yeah. There you go right there. So that bait right there, it stands out. So obviously the sun's going to hit it from the back. I'm going to show them a belly shot of this particular bait. The bait really glows under the sun, stands out, which is really, really cool. Um, it's It's been a good one, too, but this one right here in specific, I've done the most damage on. I Actually, it's funny. I ordered the baits up, and all of a sudden, the next day, the store stock came, and I was like, oh, that's cool. But definitely something cool. Obviously, not that heavy a rod. These particular baits, the Kai Tech Easy Shaker, standard drop shot rod, you don't need to run, run the one size up. I do find... The lightest weight possible has been key with this particular bait. So I'm talking like uh, 1 8 ounce, 3 16 Normally I start with a quarter ounce, but 1 8 to 3 16 Again, the Zoner Crank right here, the Don Ivino Special, I guess you can call it. These guys right here, swimming de running depth about 6 foot. Don't have to throw it on a heavy tackle. A really, really cool bait. And last but not least, the Sniper Baits. These little jokers right here, little finesse shads. They have, like I said, the Nymph. They have the, the you know the, the smaller shad baits, and then you have your mini jigs right here. Over here at Last Chance Bait and Tackle and the online store, we've never really been super trout oriented. So we kind of have a little trout section. We have, you know, Panther Martins, Rooster Tails, uh, Cast Masters, all that kind of cool stuff. So the only thing we kind of lacked in a little bit was our smaller plastics. So we did find that it was kind of cool that these guys came about and we were able to actually stock our shelves with some really, really cool plastics that not only fish for trout, panfish, but can also go into the large bass. And that he's a local guy. Yeah, a local guy, so he's in tune with what we have out here. He's not going to be throwing us fluorescent colors, all that wacky stuff. If people want it, we can get it, and he's actually local to the point where if, he, if we wanted to, we may be able to work with him and see if he can do something special. But uh, there you have it. There's a couple different baits right there I found to be beneficial um, that you might look into that might, you might have never heard about. So on to Diamond Valley. Now I'm going to talk about, like I said, 
twice before, I'm going to talk about a couple different things that I've noticed over this past week. A lot of you guys that are probably watching Periscope, some out of the state, some relatively local that are tuning in, uh, you don't have the ability to come out here every single day to stay on top of these fish. Every day is a new day when you come to Diamond Valley. So I'm hoping with these periscopes right here, if I can weasel in a little week in review for Diamond Valley, it might save you guys a lot of trouble to picking apart the lake, to figure out where I need to be, what I need to do, what I need to use. Um, I got a lot of good positive response from the last periscope where I talked about the couple tips and tricks that I was doing at that current time. A couple guys actually went out there and caught a lot of fish doing it. So it was a good feeling. So obviously you know that Diamond Valley was at a low point as far as water level. Okay, all of a sudden the valves turned on and we started getting water in there. So water started coming up. Now, I'm going to actually show you. I drew a couple little diagrams. It's been a long time since I busted out the whiteboard. Move these gates out of the way. So, basically what you have going on. Diamond Valley was at a low point right here. There wasn't a whole lot of offshore cover or structure besides a few old sticks, um, avocado groves, like not avocado, but like orange trees and stuff that Quinn had dumped there previously. So water was low. As water started to rise, it started flooding shoreline brush, just like this. And one thing that we know bass do in rising water is they'll, they'll actually follow that water and retreat into the cover that it's actually flooding. So it makes it a little bit difficult. So water's rising just like this. It's flooding all sorts of stuff out to like 25 foot of water. So on a lake that's barren, okay, that doesn't have a lot of growth, whether it be grass, trees, all that kind of stuff, fish will set up on any key obvious structure cover. They're going to be on one boulder, they're going to be on one stick, they're going to be on a boulder pile, they're going to be on a point, all that kind of random stuff. So you're going to find a lot of fish grouped up into certain areas. makes it really easy to find these fish. And after Diamond Valley, we know that it rises and it drops and it rises and it drops. Every time it rises, sits there, the vegetation dies off, we always find that it's even better fishing. We can fish offshore with a jig, we can Texas rig, we can drop shot, we can do all sorts of cool stuff. Now that water's flooding again, it makes it tough because now fish can go anywhere. They don't have to be in any one specific rock pile. They're not grouped here. So you got fish that are going to be roaming. You got upper water column fish on the shoreline brush. You have fish off the first break right here, um, which would be like that 25 to 30 foot zone. That's our outside tree edge, outside grass edge, all that kind of good stuff. Then you're going to have fish offshore. So it's hard. Uh, the way I describe it to people right now is it's very good fishing. I mean, don't, get, don't mistake what I'm saying with this. It's very good fishing, but it's hard to find locations that are, have the, the grouping numbers of fish. So with the water rising, you're, we're forced right now to constantly move around that lake. Um, it's not simple as, I'm going to fish this stretch right here. I'm going to go across the lake and fish that stretch. Fish are literally everywhere. I'm fishing open water fish. I'm fishing structure fish down in 30 foot of water. And I'm also pounding the bank. All in one day, i got a couple different patterns going on in one day. So... With this, one thing I noticed that I want to actually show you is as the water keeps rising, just like this, the weirdest thing in the world for me, and maybe, maybe I'm just overthinking things, but I've noticed my fish have been generally that 15, oh, generally that 20 to 25 foot fish. It's all outside structure spots, main lake points, all that kind of stuff I'll talk about in a second. But as the water continues to rise, my fish aren't moving. My fish are staying out there. I'm fishing 30 foot now. Like I went out there yesterday and I was pulling fish out of like, what was it, 35 to 38 foot of water. I was showing my dad how to use the power poles on the skeeter and everything. I backed up to a point. I was like, check this out, dad. I double tap, that thing shot down. I was on a main link point. And for those of you that think that power poles are not good for Diamond Valley, obviously I've never been in a boat to use one at Diamond Valley. Because I'm telling you right now, um, it started blowing like 13 miles an hour or so, which isn't that bad. But it was enough to where you're on the shoulder motor constantly. I backed up on a windblown point. It was a rocky point. And I'm sitting there going like, oh, crap, it's now or never. I'm going to test this thing. Obviously, you want to use a power pole for softer cover or whatever. So I backed up on that thing. I'm looking at that prop, and I'm thinking in the back of my head. It's like, if I gouge this prop, Dan is going to castrate me. So I'm backing up, double tap, dropped it down there. It held me straight square on that point into the wind. I'm still on the trolling motor thinking to myself that I need to adjust really quick, but I was able to actually methodically fish a spot without having to get blown around all crazy. So, long story short, I did throw a cast out. I was like, ah, what the hell, I'm already here. My dad's all stoked that I'm, he's in a skeeter and I'm standing with power poles in the back. But I'm a Texas rig out to deep water. 
Okay, and I didn't know how deep I was. I haven't fished that spot since the lake went went low. Start shaking. I start pulling into this outside bush edge right here. And little did I know, I got bit. Set the hook. It was a nice three-pounder or so. Um, get him up. I was like, that was bitching. That was cool. You know, I, I got a chance to use the power poles on a wind plump, wind blown point. Everybody said it couldn't be done. It was awesome. So without me knowing that depth, I motored out there to deeper water, and I found out it was like in that 30 zone. I can't remember exactly how deep it was. It was either 30, 35 to 38, something like that. So with the water rising, I'm noting my, noticing my fish are still holding on that defined edge right there. So don't feel that you only have to fish the shoreline brush out there. It's okay to fish deeper. We have fish scattered literally everywhere. And it's fun because right now you can almost pick your type of fish. You can pick your post-spawn fish. You can fish your, pick your fish that are already in summertime patterns. There's even fish that are still spawning on Diamond Valley, which is wacky. It's kind of cool. So yeah, what I'm doing is I'm basically looking for that kind of stuff. Now, the shoreline fish, I'm noticing, for me, maybe others are you know not seeing the same thing, I'm noticing that my shoreline fish are my smaller grade fish. They're my one to three pound class fish. I'm, focused, I'm fishing offshore. I'm fishing more boulders mixed with grass. I'm finding my fish are better. They're four pounders. They're five pounders. I put together a really, really good sack this past week. Uh, maybe, yeah, it was about this past week, I think it was. My days go together on that lake. I'm out there. But uh, I have one just under 30 pounds. And I was like, dude, this is awesome. I left the shallow stuff because I was fishing nothing but shallow the first couple trips. I went offshore and fished the deeper stuff, and there they were. I didn't have a fish smaller than four pounds off one particular spot. It's getting blown up now. I'll actually give it to all you guys on, on uh, Periscope right now if you want to go fish there. But uh, on the East Dam, okay, those of you that can picture Diamond Valley, on the East Dam, you got that middle island right smack dab in the middle of the lake on the dam. If you go towards the far end, the south end of the East Dam, right between the two, there's a long point that comes off of the dam, marked by several trees on the dam itself. You know, this isn't a, a, a famous, or this isn't a, a secret spot. We've been fishing for a long time. I found it the first day I went on Diamond Valley. It was very, very cool. Um, it's been holding, it's slowing down a little bit. For those of you that actually want to get on this deeper bite and try to figure out what's going on, very, very good starting point. I mean, there's been like five boats, you know, five boats, it seems like by half the day that rotated that spot. There's a lot of fish there, but they're getting spookier now. So obviously when I talk about it, I'm fishing more open or offshore main lake type stuff. I've told a lot of people that my main bite is on main lake points. And I, it's a simple. For those of you that aren't familiar with Main Lake Points, you, you just go to the lake and go fishing. Main Lake Points are the outermost points that jut out in the main body of the lake. You're talking stuff like this, like this, like this. Everything I have, these little dots on there. One thing that I'm doing is I'm cycling Main Lake Points that have heavy rock on it. Rock is my indicator right now. Um, I want boulders. I want the biggest rock I can find. It sucks because you get snapped. But the bigger rock right now... You know, at the depth that it was for such long periods, we started to grow grass, just like this. You can see that little picture right here. I mean, imagine this in the back of your head. You got boulders out there with grass. What that's doing is that's collecting prickly back sculpin. It's collecting bluegill. It's collecting all that kind of stuff. Therefore, what do you think is going to happen? It's like a bait receiver on the ocean or like a sport boat braille and bait. It's collecting bass, too. Bass are not going to leave a food source. And that's one reason I think these offshore spots are holding sometimes better than the bank stuff. Because everything on the bank, is, there's so much vegetation, there's so much tree life. Those bluegill can hide everywhere. On a spot like this, it collects them and they're isolated. They can't go anywhere. So these bass know that patrolling them and therefore, you know, it's going to happen. They're going to kill them, they're going to destroy them. So I'm just cycling my spots. And I'm sampling a little everything right now. Because I'm not throwing the swim bait, I'm not locked in to... I gotta hit this bank and this bank and do it before anybody else. I'm having fun because I can slow down and really pick apart that lake. Um, another spot, you know, the islands out on Diamond Valley, the middle of the islands, they're holding fish. But for most of my particular bite that I'm fishing, you've probably seen me ripping around that lake. I'm having a good old time driving that boat. But uh, all my stuff is main lake structure spots. And for those of you that are struggling to find the depth that's best suited for you, there's a quick tip. Um, what you can do is most anglers are running Lowrance graphs, okay? I've always ran Lowrance. I have an experiment with Rayleon, Hummerbird, all that kind of stuff. But with, on your Lowrance graph, one big thing that you should all have in the back of your head is knowing, um, knowing how to adjust your graph sensitivity to find the thermocline. Thermocline is the best oxygen level in that lake. 
And I was sitting there yesterday. I took my dad out, like I said, and I actually struggled yesterday. I didn't have a really crazy day on the water. The day before that, I murdered him. I'll talk about that in a second. But yesterday, I actually kind of had to work hard for fish, and it was kind of weird. So I was started to go back to basics and go, okay, where's my thermocline? What do I have to do to find the active feeding zone or active oxygen level spot in the lake? So one quick tip for your fish finders. Bump your sensitivity up to the point in which it barely goes, you know, nasty on the graph. You can actually see in certain areas where, let me move this over here, you'll see a, a faint line on your graph. Okay, it could be at 10 foot, it could be at 12 foot, it could be at 15 foot, whatever. 30 foot, 40 foot, 50 foot. You're going to see a faint line. That'll pick up as your thermocline on your graph. That's the best oxygen level in that lake. So what I like to do is I like to find structure spots at or just below, above the thermocline. Very seldom will fish hang below, but at or just above. That's not the depth the thermocline's at right there, but you'll see that kind of stuff right here. It's a safe assumption that when you find that thermocline, you're going to find a good active group of fish. So um, I'm going to meter a spot. I'm going to say, okay, well, I got bit in 25, 30 foot of water or whatever, so I'm going to start metering around. Let's go find new spots. Rather than sit there and put the trolling motor down and go, you can quickly locate depths and what cover and structure these fish are hanging on by zipping around the lake. Use your TV screens on your boat. That's what you bought it for. Very seldom do people actually use it. So definitely look at your thermocline. Um, look for cover structure accordingly and then pick it apart, figure out how those fish are relating to it. Are they suspended or are they on the bottom? So there you have it. There's your, my quick little rundown on location and what I'm finding. Obviously with water rising, you can fish that shallow cover. You're still going to catch fish. But don't forget about that offshore stuff. Um, offshore fishing is my strong point. I love fishing deep structure. And one of these periscopes, I'll go into detail on how I pick apart deep water like I would on the bank. But uh, main lake structure spots locate boulders with isolated grass on them. I'm noticing that's one of the key patterns for me is if I'm not around the rock, the heavy rock, and I'm not around the grass, I'm not catching bass. So find the food source according to that right there. Find the part of the water column they're hanging on and put a bait right in front of their face. So primarily right now, what I got going for me on Diamond Valley, obviously in last week's Periscope I talked about the big worm and over the you know overall bigger underspin type stuff. I talked about the Blade Runner head. I talked about the Upton's Customs or Bass Chow Worms. And that's still a viable bite. Uh, but I did some things a little bit different. On the spot on the East Dam I talked about, I came there on, uh, I think it was Saturday, and I, uh, you know, obviously it takes me a little bit to, you know, launch my boat and all that kind of good stuff. So I went out there and everything like that. I went to go to the first spot. I want to go to that spot on the dam. So I started cruising over there. I wasn't really booking it or nothing. There was a boat on it. So I was like, man, I really want to go shake some worms, see if I can duplicate that big, big limit. Needless to say, stuff happens. You got to adapt. So I was like, okay, well, that was my A spot for my big fish. I was like, okay, let's go around the lake. So I kind of sat there and said to myself, why do the sure thing? I know it sounds crazy to some of you guys, but why go after fish that you already know you can catch when it's a good idea to constantly advance and find different things and experiment? You're going to be stagnant if you fish the same thing over and over. You're going to find that you're not learning anything. You're only going the same thing. So when a new bite happens, you're going to be behind the bite other people are going to catch fish around you if you stay doing the same thing all the time. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to flip the script. Post it on Facebook, show it to everybody, kind of that whole thing. So I was like, you know what? Topwater fish are there. Rusty Brown, a very, very good guide in our area, was catching some topwater fish. I was like, you know what? I'm going to experiment a little bit. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go back to basics. So I picked up the Mega Bass bait. F575 double X Orochi rod, 30 pound power pro splice to 15 pound fluorocarbon or monofilament leader. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to go find a spot, and uh, you know, I'm going to work on this bite. It was real choppy in the main lake, so I found some off-color, uh, 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 not off-color, but classier water, you know, not really nasty up water. Started attacking with this here. You know, I bom bom bombed the cast out there, crossed this one point, boom, caught a four-pounder. Dude was right next to me, and he was like, okay, whatever. Put that fish in the live well, start doing some other stuff. Bomb another cast out there, hooked like a three. I started crushing them yes, or on Saturday. I, up until 9 o'clock, I was on a full-speed topwater bike, throwing this bait right here. Now, it never happens to me that way. I don't just grab a bait off the shelf or buy a bait and immediately start wrecking fish. Usually it's a process to finally figure out the bait, but it was immediate. Um, definitely thought it was something special. So those of you that are thinking about going out to Diamond Valley, be a good idea whether you buy the mega bass bait that's cool you know if, if you do if you do you know, if you don't whatever um sammy 
128 size, uh, super spooks, that kind of thing, shower blows by Evergreen. I really believe those baits are right, right on the cusp of seeing a really good topwater bite, and you can probably duplicate it with those, but I was actually throwing the HT Tennessee Shad right here. Um, turned out to be a really, really cool day. Finished the day off by drop shotting a bunch of fish on Margaret and Mutilator and Electric Bluegill right here. The bite's not going to be there every day. I took my dad out on Sunday. The second day, I was like, oh, I'm going to murder the top water fish. You need to be here. It's going to be fun. We went out there, got one blow up on the top water. It happens. What do you got to do? You got to adapt. We ended up catching them on Sankos and Texas rigs. So Diamond Valley right now is ever-changing, and so you got to be on your toes. I mean, there's a lot of consistent bites out there. Underspin bite's still there. The worm bite's still there. I'm catching those fish almost every, actually every trip. Um, top water bite's kind of new, and there should be really, really getting on a good swim, uh, swim jig bite. Because right now, I'm noticing all my offshore stuff, my longer taper main lake points, all that kind of good stuff. There's a certain time every year where the bluegill will get in big numbers. And I was talking with a local guy today, and we basically kind of started brainstorming because we like to do that kind of stuff and challenge each other. Brainstorm and talk about how and what these fish are doing. So one thing that I've noticed in the past couple days, weeks, whatever, has been there's been an ever-growing number of bluegill in big schools underneath our boats in certain areas around the lake. And what we're seeing every year, this happens. And when that happens, the deep swim jig bite, um, like in years past, has been the best. Same with the deep spinnerbait bite. You find those schools of bluegill, you find those rock, and you throw it deep and just bump the bottom with it. Very, very cool bite. So I think we're right on the cusp of seeing a good, good swim jig bite. Um, it'll, it'll happen, you know, once we get some more stable weather, we had some, you know, cold, cold weather this past weekend, but definitely get out there. It's, it's like I said before, it's a very good bite, but it's tough in locating them. Some guys are going to catch 30, some guys are going to catch three. So it's one of those things where you got to adapt with the fish, move around and don't be afraid for those of you that are swim bait guys, you don't got to throw it all day to catch one fish, catch some fish, you know what I mean? You bought all that stuff, catch some fish. If you see the opportunity, wind blowing points in your point system, throw the swim bait. But don't feel that you're constricted to only throwing big all the time. It's a lot of fun when you scale down, you catch a bunch of fish, then you you basically get comfortable, then you go back to your swim bait thing. It's very important to be well rounded. So um, definitely if any of you guys have any questions on anything, you know, you need any help, you know, feel free to, you know, ask any questions. Not it's pretty cut and dry. <laughs> I doubt there's any questions about this. Just hearts. Okay. Oh, I got a lot of hearts? Okay. I heart you guys. <laughs> oh, Somebody wants to know when you're going to do a surface iron periscope. Someone wants to see a surface iron periscope. Uh, to, yeah, I can do it anytime. If you guys want to talk about jigs, you want to talk about rods, reels, line, what I found to be the best for me, I can definitely sh share you some info. In the previous or the next periscopes, we're actually going to start talking about the saltwater bite out there. And those of you that don't really follow the saltwater bite, you might want to. We're seeing history in the making right now. Um, Three-quarter day boats, there's, there's fish within half day range. You're talking fish over 100 pounds. You're talking 230 pound fish. And I don't know if Megan can walk over here right now. Just to put it in perspective as to what is off our coast right now. This fish right here, uh, it's 284. or 280 something, I don't know. 284. So that's 284 pounds, okay? Let's put this in perspective right now. We've had fish off our coast 200 and what, 35? 34 was 234? day before yesterday at Some Fisherman's. Stupid fish like Fisherman's that. processing. This right here, three-quarter day range, overnight boat range, that kind of stuff, you might want to take notice on the saltwater bite. So in the next couple of periscopes, we're going to talk about what it takes to gear up for something like this. Um, obviously, rods, reels, baits, that kind of stuff. And uh, it's definitely there for the taking, guys. So if you guys have any questions about that, again, you know, stop in here. We're, we got a good pulse on as to what's going on, where they're biting, uh, the good temp break and stuff like that. But another thing I actually want to talk about, for those serious about looking at a skater boat, um, one of the little obligations I have with Last Chance Performance Marine is to actually show the boat off. So if any of you want to actually take notice and take a look at, at uh, my Skeeter FX20, the LE, Feel free to get a hold of me, either here at Last Chance Bait and Tackle, on Facebook, Matt Magnone, Instagram, whatever. Um, and I can actually take time out of my, you know, out of one of my days off or whatever to meet up with you guys if you want to look at the boat, take it on a demo ride, all that kind of stuff. So definitely get a hold of me. It's best to get a hold of me ahead of time so I know. I can't really do stuff last minute because it just doesn't work that way for me. I end up forgetting. 
So uh, you have to let me know ahead of time. If you guys want to take it for a spin, uh, definitely let me know. Either here at Last Chance Bait and Tackle, 951-658-7410, or get a hold of me online. But uh, there you have it. We thank you for your business and look forward to helping you guys become better anglers.